Okay. okay, let's start. So, uh, thanks for joining the, the presentation. Uh, to crash or not to crash, if you do, at least recover fast. Crash, uh, the bug and that part of uh, kernel, it's very interesting error for me, yeah, oddly, because it's, it's broken stuff, right? So, uh, I'm Guilherme. I will present now uh, this topic. So, for those that uh, don't know me, some, some people already know me. So, I always loved computers since I was a kid. I started programming super early. Then I go to mathematics. I went to, to a, a bachelor in applied mathematics. And then a master here in Unicamp at IC. Uh, then I moved to IBM. My first work was IBM Linux Technology Center. So, I worked there in kernel, in PowerIO. Uh, Power PC mainly, PCI stuff, PCI 64, etc. In KW, which uh, we, we were going to talk uh, a bit soon. Then I moved to, to Canonical some years later, working in sustainable engineering, which is a uh, support team. We worked uh, as a support engineer, less level engineer. So if customers had trouble and anything, we need to, to debug and provide solutions. And there I worked with Ubuntu, Kernel, some uh, user space, and KW again. And finally, I moved to Igalia recently, which is a worker-owned cooperative. So very interesting uh, place, uh, focused on uh, open source and free software. It's very interesting to work there. Work, there, I'm working in x86, BurFS, and a bit of KDump again. Right? So what is a uh, kernel crash panic? or panic. Crash and panic are synonyms, right? So Linux is uh, mostly a regular software, right? Written in C, and a bit of Rust recently. And so there, there are bugs. And when the kernel detects a problem, we call it oops. It's not a panic per se, it's the, the kernel detecting the problem, right? Uh, some causes of the problem are no pointers, uh, lockups, uh, no pointers, it's not like the, the programmer uh, wrote uh, wrong code like doing new stuff. It's because of concurrency, as, as uh, SMP, multiple CPUs. So you need locking mechanisms and whatnot. And uh, we have lockups. Lockups, for example, uh, soft lockups. We have interrupts that take a while and the kernel threads, they get stuck. So it's called soft lockup. The kernel is delaying processing, right? Hard lockups are different, are when uh, you, you have the same situation but in interrupt context. So you cannot exit that context. Those situations, uh, you can configure the kernel to panic on that. Panic is an, an action that is taken when an oops is detected. So oops is a error, error, error log and whatnot. Panic is the action that is taken for the kernel. For example, you can reboot in such action. You can collect the data. We are going to, to mention more about this, right? Uh, other conditions, uh, out of memory situations, uh, invalid memory, if a driver access, for example, pages that they cannot access for some reason, you can have this problem as well. And you have also the bug call, which is, is very interesting. If a programmer, a programmer, for example, a kernel model, uh, they consider that a special corner case could not happen. But if that happens, it's completely crazy, shouldn't happen. You can put a bug there. So basically, the kernel will uh, force a crash in this situation, right? Oh, yeah, have, uh, Caesar keys as well. Uh, Caesar keys are a mechanism to induce a bank. If you prefer to induce for tests and whatnot, you can. You can also do that. So th that's uh, a portrait of a kernel panic. I usually don't don't like to put codes in slides because it's, it's a bit difficult to read and whatnot. I try to, to make it uh, visible here, uh, like black on, on white. So this is a portrait. Uh, a panic can vary. The, the log, of course, can vary based on the cause of the panic and whatnot. So in this case, uh, worth to take a look, especially in the bold lines. Uh, kernel, it, this case was a new pointer difference, right? Uh, page fault, you CPF there, which uh, it's an x86 exception. Exception may vary based on different architectures. Uh, we have oops, uh, the oops entry, and a call trace. You can see a call trace that helps to understand how it failed. Uh, the, the, the call trace of the functions that reach the fail. Uh, RIP is a register in x86 that shows the, the function that failed specifically, that the problem in this case was DRM scat fini. It was a real case. Uh, so we debugged that. It was a uh, wrong stuff there and we managed to fix. So this is what it looks like. We, we can see the kernel version in this specific one is 6.1. Uh, 
uh, dash Valve. And Valve is the company, the gaming company. I'll reach to there, but uh, this presentation is related with gaming as well. Uh, panics on, on game devices. So, uh, how does it happen? So the kernel detects the problem, as I said, and show that kind of uh, logs. Uh, there are some CCTLs and some tunings you can configure to force the panic. So oops is detected. You can leave with the oops, right, if you want. But uh, you can trigger the panic. And the goal for triggering the panic is to recover the system because system in oops stage is not really reliable. Some models, some parts are broken, right? So you don't know the, the implications of that. So you might want to, to reboot in this case. Some tunings are, for example, panic on, on out of memory situations, on lockups, on hand tasks. So you can uh, configure the kernel to panic in those situations. The panic condition is very abrupt and arch dependent. So as I mentioned in the log, the registers uh, of the log are x86, but risk 5 or ARM are different, depending on the, on the architecture, things change. Uh, this is an oversimplified code flow of the panic, right? So the panic process involves disable our IRQ, preemption, which is the scheduling of threads and whatnot, uh, and then dump the stack. If you configure KDump, which I'll mention later, I needed to mention here because of the flow, but it's kind of a chicken or egg situation. Because if I mention KDump here, uh, I, I didn't talk about that. But if I don't mention, I couldn't uh, present this uh, diagram. So if you manage to, to configure KDump, you go to crash KZAC and KZAC code. If not, uh, we disable the other CPUs. Uh, we go to panic notifiers and key message dump, which I will also talk later and eventually reboot the machine, if that's configured, uh, arch code to reboot the machine, right? So, what can we do? This is the, the main topic here. Uh, we, can, we can reboot and pretend nothing happened, right? Or we can use this opportunity to collect data because we're broken, so if we can collect the data, it's very interesting uh, in, a, in a panic. We have some ways of doing that, uh, VM core is a memory image of the broken kernel. Uh, it's the k-dump mechanism, which I'll, I'll go through more. And the message is the kernel log, right? So you can collect only the kernel log or the VM core and the kernel log as well. We also can use console for that, uh, net or serial consoles. For example, if you, you, you have a server, usually you have serial outputs. You can collect those logs based on pictures or you can uh, dump through screen or tmux or a mechanism like that. Net console is another thing in the kernel, but I don't really like that because basically is uh, configure network and a network console. But if the kernel is broken in oops or panic, uh, network might not be real, reliable. So it's not really great way of doing that. And we have KDMP store, uh, which are the main topics here, and uh, debuggers. For example, Xmon was a debugger in RPC. So if the kernel reach that condition, you can check stuff there, like GB-like GB interface. So you can dump your register and whatnot, right? KGDB is also a debugger, but I don't, I'm not really, I don't really know that. Never used KGDB before. So the first method is collecting all the data, KDump. So uh, KDump works like this. Uh, KZEC is a technology that the kernel will jump to another kernel. You not go through to the BIOS, for example, the firmware, right? So uh, this technology allows, for example, fast reboot uh, and, and the, the KDUMP mechanism, which is KDUMP, the KZEC, a crash kernel, which is a kernel that collects the memory of the first kernel that's broken. So it's a, it's a smart idea. You, you reserve some memory, put a kernel there, like a reserve kernel. Then if the kernel breaks, you jump to this new kernel. It's a new boot like uh, there, there's user space and whatnot, tools, to read the memory of the, the broken kernel and uh, save that, for example, in a storage or a net, through network, you can use SSH to save that information, right? Uh, and VM Core, as I said, is the memory of the, the, the broken kernel. The, the advantage of that is that the, the memory dump can be inspected later. Uh, here's some more advantages. Right, you can do post-mortem analysis. That's the main use of that. So if you have the memory of the, the other, uh, the, the broken kernel, you can inspect that in a GDB-like tool it's called Crash. You can send to somebody else to, to ex examine for you, for example, some company that does this work. This was kind of a work I did in, in Canonical. So customers sent KDUMPs for me. 
So I needed to, to take a look in the logs and figure what's, what's going on, right? Uh, advantage is also if you can collect the logs through network, right? But there are some disadvantages, some, some challenges of KDAP, a bunch of them, in fact. So the first one is that you require a preserved uh, area, a uh, memory area, to, to this other kernel, the, the KDAP kernel, as we call. And this uh, is more and more latent. Uh, for example, actually, mm, 200 megabytes is the minimum today. So if you have a small machine or embedded device or anything, 200 megabytes pre-reserved is not great, right? Uh, Crash kernel. Uh, there are some risks also in the in the in the KDAM. Broken kernel shutdown. It's not really a risk for KDAM because uh, it's a risk of the, the panic situation, right? The kernel can break in the situation. You cannot bring the the other kernel. Cannot cannot KZEC. But if you do KZEC, there are other challenges like crash kernel booting problems or the data collection phase. Uh, the the KZEC kernel, when booting, it will need to restart the devices, for example, PCI devices. And PCI resets, as I said here, is a nightmare. It's very difficult because it's arch dependent. PowerPC, for example, uh, has some uh, tricks to do that in firmware. So kernel can communicate with the firmware and reset the devices. But uh, x86 does not have that, right? So uh, you can, the device cannot work and, and break the process of boot of this KDUM kernel. And I'll tell about a true story about this soon. Next slide. Uh, other problems of KDAM, no graphics on KDAM, and long boot delay. So basically, the, the KZ kernel is simple. So you usually don't uh, start drivers, uh, graphic drivers. So you don't have output. So user does not know what's going on, right? Uh, it, it, it can incur some, uh, some long boot delays. And I put there film core compatibility. It's not really a flaw of KDAM, but it happens that the tool that collects the memory of uh, the broken kernel is called make them file. You need to adjust that tool to new versions of the kernel. So you need to keep track of that and it must be updated, right? Uh, so so it's, a, it's more or less a, it require, a requirement of the distro you are using, usually, right? Uh, if people have questions, uh, please feel free to, to uh, do that now. It's, it's interesting as well. So a true case, interrupt storm. As I mentioned, the, the PCI resets are very arch dependent. Uh, PowerPC has these uh, firmware calls you can do to reset the devices, but x86 x86 does not have. So this case was like we work in a, in a customer situation in which the customer was using an Intel uh, network card through DPDK. DPDK is a user space driver. Instead of using the kernel uh, stack, it uses uh, the, this user space stuff. And the customer wrote a module to the PDK to collect statistics on the device. Okay, so eventually we, we received the, the support call that the machine was not uh, booting in the KDAM kernel. And the reason of that was that this DPDK mod was triggering a bad condition on the firmware of the device and uh, creating a storm of interrupts. The device was interrupting like continuously. So the kernel just cannot continue. So uh, we, we can configure KDUMP. KDUMP is going to boot, right? But then during the boot process, when the interrupt controller uh, is initialized, there is already a bunch of interrupts there. So the KDUMP kernel also cannot boot. The same as the, the bad kernel, the, the old kernel that was broken. Mm -hmm. So how to debug this? It was very complex. And in the end, the solution was to use a mechanism x86 to write some early code in entry points of x86 to perform a clear of the MSIs, which are the interrupts of the device. And this acted as a reset for this. And then the KDAM was made possible. There is a link here for the discussion. It's an interesting discussion, but it was not accepted, unfortunately, because the, the PCI maintainer complained that this early infrastructure is too restrictive. It's only for the, the bus zero of PCI, but new servers has more PCI devices, more buses. It's something new. So since it was a bit uh, limited, he preferred not to accept that. I disagree a bit, but I may, I may get back to it eventually. So is this an x86 only problem? Uh, what problem, you mean? The PCI storm? The PCI storm, storm no, it could, it could happen in other machines. But for example, a poor PC has the PCI reset stuff. The ski boot, remember ski boot? Okay. So uh, you can kernel, during the, the KZAC process of the KDUMP in the poor PC, there is a call to ski boot firmware that resets all the devices and put that in the original state. It's the same that happens in, in x86 during the regular boot. The BIOS does this. Problem is, 
in x86, there is no API for that. It's like a vendor dependent. Uh, the BIOS does this. So KSEC has no access for this, right? So it might happen in other architectures. So, so I mean, mm. sorry, uh, Go ahead. Interrupt. I have a question about the mm. previous slide, actually. Preview. You said that you have to preserve memory. Yeah. How do you know how much memory you need to reserve? Because I remember that was quite a challenge back in the IBM days to decide how much memory you should reserve to the to to the data, uh, to, for the memory. Right? Exactly. This is a big. Uh, this is a great question because it's a big problem, and the customers in Canonical also face that problem of uh, reserving them the memory. So you don't know. Basically, you don't know. The way people usually do is to test. Remember I mentioned CSRQ, so induce a panic and test. But there are other ways. I worked in Canonical in a memory estimator for that. So it's like um, it, it checks early in the boot time uh, how much memory was consumed. Do some heuristics with number of CPUs because KDump kernel usually is only it's a mono CPU kernel, right? Only a single CPU. And I figured out when I finished working on this estimator that Fedora has a, a similar tool, but Fedora one requires a reboot. So you configure uh, the tool to reboot and perform the analysis, and then it, sh it tells you, oh, should uh, save, uh, I don't know, 200 megabytes, for example. But usually it's done man manually, uh, is the way that it's usually done. So it can happen in all the instruments, and well, that's very difficult. The estimator, by the way, was not merged, uh, because Debian KDump tools maintainers are asking some stuff, and I, I didn't finish that. <laughs> right? So as, as mentioned, here we have a bunch of challenges on, on, on KDump. So there is another alternative, which is called PStore. So PStore is very interesting because it's a lightweight mechanism. The difference from KDump is that KDump requires booting on another kernel. So you can exact another kernel to collect the memory of the first one, right? PStore does not work like this. In the final phase of the broken kernel, you dump the, the kernel log, the, the PStore technology, the front ends dump the, the, the kernel log to some backend. You have multiple backends and multiple front ends. So, uh, for example, one combination that uh, we, we use uh, in, the, in our use case here, uh, it's run loops. So basically we configure a bit of this tiny portion of the memory of the machine that is reserved, not used by the kernel. So when you have the situation, you dump the, the kernel log there and reboot the machine. So it's quite fast because it's just a write into some memory reboot. You don't require another, another full reboot. And you have more front ends, which is very interesting for multiple debug approaches. You can dump, for example, the ftrace uh, log to pstore, which is the Linux tracing mechanism. I remember Garga mentioned dtrace in, free, in FreeBSD. And in, in Linux, ftrace is a similar to, to detect functions and, and that's running in the arguments and whatnot. You can dump the console. You can dump uh, user space. It's called pmessage, this front end. So some user space too can collect, uh, dump to, to pstore as well. And as for the backends, you have run UFI. Uh, so you basically dump to uh, UFI variable. The problem is that it's a bit small, right? But you can, uh, a small message fits there. Uh, ACPI Erst, which is another area for uh, ACPI, is the protocol of the, the BIOS in x86. So there is an error facility there. And even a block device, recently it was added. If you have a block device, you want to fully use that for a PStore, it's possible as well, right? So uh, the benefits of PStore, it's kind of, uh, it's very fast because it's, it's uh, in the end part of the, the bank that this process happens, right? You don't need to bootstrap a new kernel. It's more secure, less prone to failures. Although I put citation in because the kernel is in a panic state. So of course it can, it can be, so broken that it, it's unable to do the pstore. But usually it's very safe. It usually works, right? It does not require KSX support uh, and can be used to another, as I said, to another front ends like F trace and whatnot. For me, the, the best advantage is that you don't require to, to keep 200 megabytes stuck there for nothing because you should not panic usually. It's a rare condition. So basically block that amount of memory and all boots, right? With PSTAR, uh, you don't do this. You don't need that if you are using RAM. If you're using UFI, for example, you need no memory at all because UFI has this storage area. So these are the main advantages of PSTAR. Just one question. Sure. Regarding the, the where does it save the, the crash file? Because mm. it's a good question. 
you, you can save. It's, it's very flexible, usually, because it's a new kernel that put it there. It's basically, uh, you can think it's a minimal distro that puts. So for example, you can configure network there and dump through SSH into another machine. You can dump in the storage, a different storage like USB. The storage can be in a broken state. Too. Exactly. That's one of the big problems. So what we did in the past, in IBM times, uh, IBM machines had multiple storages. So we reserved one storage for that because it's a different driver. Because imagine you, you have, a, I don't know, AHCI, which is the usual ID <laughs> devices for most computers. So if this driver is broken and causes the panic, it might put the, the device, the PCI device, in a really bad state. So when the KDump will start without the PCI reset, device is broken. Guess what happens? Yeah. Right? The, you cannot collect the data and the machine might be stuck, which is even worse. The user does not, happen, does not know what's, what's happening because there is no output, no graphic output. So it's, it's way trickier. And uh, the, the PStore, you have the specific backends, right? So it's more safe, mm -hmm. right? So these are the benefits, the, the, the challenges of PStore. Uh, the, the main one, obviously, you, you are not collecting the full VM core, the full memory image, so you will lose data. But for most cases, uh, the message is enough to, to understand the problem. And you, you can circumvent that with the panic print option. So you can print more stuff. For example, you can print the states of the user space processes, the memory, and uh, the states of the memory, if it's OOM or whatnot, timers, uh, the locks that are taken. So it's a very big message full of question. Yes, uh, to use it, uh, basically, it's just like KDAP. You change the, uh, the kernel uh, memory. How do I set my system to use to use PStore? Uh, I'm going to talk about about PStore setting, but there's the problem is that there is no tool to do this. KDump usually has a tool like KDump tools. PStore that, now there is a new tool, but I'll mention that right. soon. Okay, so you can circumvent that at disadvantage, right? And another problem of the PStore is that it runs after the panic notifiers. Panic notifiers works like this: when the the, the kernel panics, there is a list that any driver, any portion of the kernel can uh, add an entry there. What does it mean that uh, when it panics, this list is run and functions callbacks are called based on devices that register this such function. So people can do whatever they want during the panic time. So a lot of problems uh, can happen there. For example, remember the the diagram, we disable other CPUs, we disable IRQs. So imagine some, some bank notifier takes a lock, a mutex. So it sleeps, nobody will look up ever. It's there, it's stuck. So it's a very uh, dangerous infrastructure that must be used wisely. And uh, this link I put now, here is a link to a discussion because this is a, what, a big work we are trying to refactor those bank notifiers to be more reliable more uh, safe, uh, getting the, the panic notifiers that are currently in use, make them safe to run uh, during the panic, really, and splitting some lists. But for now, it's not merged. It's a work in progress. So uh, there's this risk, right? KTUM runs usually before the panic notifiers. Right on when the panic happens, it jumps to the new kernel, right? Just a couple of questions. Uh, sure. How new is PStore compared to KDUM? Uh, and if uh, uh, you're, I understand you're saying it's quite new, so it's uh, Schema is still a lot more utilized than PStore uh, nowadays, or is it going to change? It's a good question because none of them are new; both are kind of old. But for some reason, I don't understand. People doesn't know PStore. They don't just don't like PStore. I guess it's because they don't get more tools. I hope to change that. I hope that it changes. We can we can spread the word about the religion of, of PStore because <laughs> because you know, it's full of problems. Uh, it, it's not full of problems. It's a good technology, but it's it's a thing like a lot of times I use KDump. I need to debug KDump. So it's basically you want a mechanism to debug the kernel, but let's first debug the mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. And and PStore, I don't know. I tried that. Uh, recently, I'm going to, it, it's bad that it's the next slide, but I'll, I'll advance a bit. There's a new tool for Arch Linux that uses PStore. And when I tried first time to use the PStore, it works flawlessly, super, super simple. So both are uh, kind of uh, standard, not so new tools, but PStore is not really known for the public. And distros, they didn't invest in creating a tool for that. 
uh, so until now. So uh, mm. yeah, but I mean, you know, how 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 useful in speech store to debug real real world problems, right? Because I remember, I, mean, I remember that even with KDOM, mm. sometimes the information that you collect in the game core is not enough to debug a problem, right? Sometimes you have to reproduce the same problem multiple times, generate multiple VM cores to really understand what is going on, and you have all the kernel memory dump it there. And P store you don't have all this information. So is this really useful? I mean maybe that's why this was are investing much more on KDAM, right? Because they find it more useful. So mm -hmm. in your experience, I mean is, is P store really useful to, to help with that? Because it doesn't seem to have enough information maybe, I don't know. Yeah, it depends on the problem, right? In fact this is a trade off. And and KDump we, we mentioned here that it collects a whole memory, but device memory is not collected. So, for example, the MMIO region, the bars of a device are not connect, collected. User space data are not collected as well because, remember, I mentioned make them file, the tool that collects the, the logs. Imagine a machine you have 64 gigabytes. It's too much, right? So it cuts parts of the memory. It cuts user space. It cuts free pages, some stuff. So it's not really full. But, okay, it's, it's fair. It's a bunch of memory to debug and go through structures and whatnot and, and the term. So it's a better tool. but. Imagine like this, you have a P-Store set in all machines in the world. It's just an ideal scenario. So you have a server, like Sentry, Telemetry, those kind of technologies that I really don't understand. You submit all of those logs there. So you have statistics about that. You, you can correlate stuff and say, oh, this, this kind of crash, because you see IRP. IRP is the pointer to the, the, the function that failed, excluding the offset, because offset, of course, changes according to the build and whatnot compiler. But you just isolate the function. You can have suddenly a statistics of that function is broken. And it's enough information at least to start to configure KDump if you need more data. So it's, we can consider that tire one. But it's, in most cases, it's good enough to... to this example I, I put there, the portrait of the, the kernel bank, I just used the message to the book. I didn't use KDump at all to collect. Because KDump is, you need to navigate in these structures, so it's not easy. It's not like comfortable to do. You, you only do that in, when it's less resource. You really need to do this. Pistor, eventually you look at that and you go to the code and the function, I, you read the code, and, mm, I see the problem. You know, it, it might, it, it's very useful, in fact, for, for some kind of, of bugs. But I, I, I think you are right. People can think about that and say, ah, let me configure KDump because it's better. It collects more data. But not always the more is the best, mm -hmm. right? Because you have a bunch of risks, as we, we mentioned. So, okay, challenges of PStore and available tools. This is interesting. Uh, as I mentioned, that, that we don't have tools for, P, uh, for PStore, at least that I know. Maybe there is some, of course, GitHub people wrote some tools. But for KDump, uh, we have plenty of tools. Notice KDump and PStore are kernel technologies, so we need the user space uh, counterparts. How does that work? To, to configure KDump, you need to configure the, the kernel command line to reserve that memory. Then you need to you put a new kernel, right? The minimal one. And the minimal one must have the tooling to collect and save that. So it's a bunch of scripts and whatnot. It's all automatic. So we have plenty of tools for Debian and Ubuntu's KDump. Uh, KDump tools, the, the, the name of the tool is KDump tools. <laughs> but uh, it's the same tool. But for, for Ubuntu, there are some patches and whatnot. For Fedora, is a uh, KZAC tools, which includes the KDump scripts. And for SUSE, it, it uses the YAST. And I remember some, I think some people remember YAST from, or people that use SUSE, right? Uh, so, no, because of them, then to see you. MTC. Yeah, the MTC, we, we use the asked a bit, but I stopped it working soon. Some, some people might be in the same condition as I am, so they forgot a bit about it. And uh, so, okay. for VM core analysis, we have some tools. Crash and Dragon. Crash is a standard one. Everybody, I guess, at one point heard about Crash and whatnot. So Crash 2 uh, is good. It's like a GDB. It includes GDB uh, in the code. Uh, it's a tarball of an old GDB you cannot update inside the code of the crash. So, but, but the people complain a bit about crash because it's not great for programmatic uh, analysis for scripting. So uh, it's not friendly for that. You can do that, but it's super difficult. So uh, re recently they created Dragon. Uh, it, I guess Meta, uh, Facebook created this too. So it's Python based. You can, you can write some Python scripts uh, and navigate to structures. So it's very friendly and powerful as well. 
But notice I didn't mention Arch Linux, right? And Arch Linux has no two, no official two. There's the week, Arch week is really great, but it shows all manual processes to configure GitHub. But then we, we are going to suddenly change subjects to a Linux in console, yeah, there is one. Hmm. This one is called uh, Steam Deck from Valve. I guess some people here heard about that as well. And this is the origin of my work recently with Pistore. Uh, I, Igalia is working with Valve in this console. I am assigned to work in the crash parts of this. And so it's a very powerful hardware. You see that there is a, a custom, a thread, a AMD uh, GPU, uh, 16 gig of RAM, three models of storage, really fast device. It's really good to use. And guess what? SteamOS 3, they have a distro. And this distro is basically Arch Linux. Right, with some with some uh, specific stuff for gaming, like Game Scope, which is a compositor, and uh, or KDE, if you want to go to desktop mode, you can use KDE. And there, there's a bunch of uh, it's very interesting how gaming is uh, improving a lot of stuff because it's a very complex to run games in Linux. Either you can uh, ask people to report that stuff to Linux, which is difficult, or you can emulate APIs, and that's the approach Valve recently took that allowed DEC to exist. Uh, they use uh, Proton now, which is Wine, uh, based upon Wine, some modifications to, to emulate the, the API for Windows. They use DXVK, which uh, it's a Vulkan emulator to direct direct X calls. So it's a big step there to, to make it work. And uh, so, so the SteamOS 3 is basically uh, an Arch Linux with this layer for gaming, and Arch has no tool for collecting crashes. So what happens is that we have KDumps, a new tool. And the name is just a joke because <laughs> KDumps is a superlative, it's better than KDumps. We In PST, it's PStore, right? So it's it's a tool that includes the PStore. Uh, this tool is, is shared script as well. It's, it supports group, supports uh, two init systems, Rakuten and init.cpio. For those that work with Arch or know more about this, init.cpio is the default. But for some reason that nobody could answer, <coughs> SteamOS 3 was using Dracut. So when I uh, wrote this tool, I needed to make it work with Dracut. As soon as I finished the tool, they changed to Twin <laughs> And it was good. <laughs> no, it's real, real story. And it was good because uh, now I can support both. I need to support both because we have versions in both, <laughs> in both stuff. So uh, having support for NCPIO may make it a generic tool for Arch Linux, right? And the big differential for, for KDumps is that it defaults to PStore. And so my first attempt to PStore in, in this deck was great because it works like a charm. And, and I'm using RAM, right, RAM backend. And checking the, the RAM buffers in this deck, I noticed that f for some alignment reasons, the kernel was ignoring 16 megabytes. Was there, not used it. So I already have the memory. I didn't need to reserve and whatnot. You asked me how uh, we can configure PStore. In this case, it was really simple to configure PStore. We can run the module remotes with some parameters. You can put the, uh, the, the condemns can do that automatically for you. But basically, you need to put an address, the memory, the size of the memory, the size of the buffer. And I, read, I already have the memory, right? But imagine you don't have the memory. The memory all consumed. So you want to reserve some stuff, uh, some portion of the memory. Uh, there is no current way in the kernel to do that easily. The way I do when I need to test in a VM and whatnot is to use the MEM parameter to reduce the memory of the kernel. The kernel. MEM equals, so is it for a gig machine, I can put MEM equals 3.8 gigabytes. So I reserve a bit 20 megabytes there, something 3.88, something, you know, like I can, I reserve. But it's not great. So this is one thing we have in the plans to work, to improve that. But so far, the, the tool is, works with Remoops, which is the RAM backend. And we have plans to make it work with UFI as well, because it's useful. Also, uh, not only group. Right now, it's group only, but we, we want to support UB kernels or UFI directly, because it's more uh, it's used today, right? Uh, the tool also customizes CCTLs, the crush kernel, because you can, op uh, you can opt to use KDump. Oh, I prefer KDump, I can collect BIM core, OK. And if you will configure crash kernel uh, parameter, it's present on the SteamOS as the DEX crash collecting tool, default. Uh, previous version, the initial version, also submitted the logs to Valve servers. 
to those sentry tele telemetry stuff that I mentioned. But we removed that from the tool because it does not belong, right? It's like overriding the tool with this functionality that does not belong there. So now there is another tool to do this. The SteamOS log submitter working for a different person that collects the GitHub data and sends it to Val, right? So I welcome you Arch Linux users to try this. It would be nice uh, to have it back. And let's see here. OK, the missing pieces. I mentioned a bit about the. I mentioned a bit about the, the panic not fires, right? Uh, which are risky, and we have a work in progress about this. We want to split that in multiple lists, not only one single list. For example, Azure or Google Cloud, they require the panic not fires for Kidam because they are, uh, have a VM, the VM panics. You need to inform some stuff to the, 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 the hypervisor and he uses panic not fires for that. So it's essential to have it. If you don't have KDM, it does not work. Uh, but others are more or less like some devices that dump, uh, there are some, some notifiers that goes to, to a device and dumps a lot of registers and whatnot. So you don't really want that by default, right? So right now you have a parameter that you can say KDump before or after the panic notifiers is like a Boolean. Either you can exclude all the panic notifiers or you can include all of them. Not great. We want to uh, split that more uh, interestingly. So some list is more mandatory for KDump, let's do it. Some list is more informational. You enable that if you want more information. For example, for PStore. In the case of PStore, you could enable that, that second list to dump more stuff in the kernel and have more information. And there are the final list, which is like, uh, wow, this is just a lot of misc stuff that put that in the list. So the work uh, is, is a bit polemic uh, because kernel panic is an area that uh, there is no maintainer for this in the kernel. It's like uh, Andro maintains, Andro AKPM, because it maintains everything that does not have a proper maintainer. So uh, it's like nobody loves this area. So when you send a patch, it's very difficult to, to get feedback and need to ping in multiple times. So it's, it's a work in progress. And, but, but we hope to finish that. Uh, as I mentioned to, to you, the, the parameter for improving the, the room reservation would be nice to have. I tried to use crash kernel for this. Crash kernel is the KDAM parameter. And it works. I can, I can use crash kernel, reserve a bit of memory, and configure pstore to use that memory. But what if the user wants both for some reason? They, they, they might want pstore, and if pstore uh, succeeds and kdump fails, at least you have some logs. If I do this, crash kernel is not enough because crash kernel is the error for the kdump. So I need a new parameter, probably. I'll, I'll take a look on that. And it's, it could be art specific because it's really early in the boot that you need to reserve that kind of memory that is out of the memory locator. Some more missing pieces in the, in the KDump word and panic word. Uh, graphical output. Graphical output is really difficult. There was a thread in the DRM list recently, re recently, like two years ago, about showing a logo or something like that during that, that, that time. But the thread died because it's very difficult to, to use GPUs. GPUs are very complex devices and they do interrupts for everything. So you disable interrupts in, in panic. So how can you work with GPUs? So it's not great. One idea would be to restore the frame buffer. If you, when the BIOS uh, in the machine, we have like a single mode called frame buffer, right? Then the device, the AMD the GPU device, uh, driver or NVIDIA, the, the big drivers, they reprogram the GPU to be really powerful and use all the power. And this is difficult. You can't usually unprogram that to back to the frame buffer. There is no infrastructure for that. If we can work on this, it would be nice. We can restore the frame buffer capability, right? But I try, I, I'm, I'm considering another approach that I think it's easier for the deck at least, uh, which is a UFI panic notifier. I was talking about panic notifier. So we will have a new panic notifier that notifies just one bit in, in the UFI, a panic happened, like wait, right? And then the BIOS can plot different in the in its stages. And the Steam Deck is very nice uh, use case for that because it's custom. We're kind of, we are in control of the firm. We can put whatever you want. And if we if we can make it work, yeah, the link is for the patches. The patches exist and, and it work, but maintainer complained a bit that it's not really useful. So I'm planning to make that work on deck and use and show to maintainer see we are using that. 
in, in the field. So we'll try to convince there is used for that. Uh, and since we, we control the, the firmware, we can plot different stuff. We can use different logos. And that would be interesting because it would be the first uh, device that has this capability. Uh, I don't know if, the, I don't I honestly know if there's any other desktop that prints stuff during the panic. So this thing that would, uh, would be one of the first or the first, uh, more like, like Nintendo Switch, if you use other consoles and they break, there is some, some logo and whatnot. It's, it's beautiful, right? So uh, Steam Deck is, is, is crude in this respect because it's just reboot. So we, we hope to change that. PCI resets, reliable PCI resets for Kidup. It's like wishful thinking. I, I would like to, to, to fix that. We have the patches there, but it's very difficult to fix. There is no perfect solution. I received feedback to use IOMMIU for this. Instead of using the early PCI ancestors to, to restart, clear MSIs and whatnot, use MMIO. But then I responded, what if we don't use MMIO? It's configured oh, so it's this case doesn't work. So basically, it's a bunch of corner cases. We need to cover most of them to have more reliable PCI resets. And to add on that, I don't know much of other architectures than Power or x86. Like RISC-V is the new architecture here, some trendy stuff. I don't know uh, how it works there. I need to test PCI resets, but it's uh, interesting stuff to, to improve. And finally, we have the, the maintainer's communication awareness, which I think is one of the big issues with uh, PStore and KDump Word and Panic and whatnot. I work in the estimator, as I mentioned, Leo, without knowing the other estimator from Fedora. There is no single community. Everybody is spread. So it's not great. I really hope we could have a more centered uh, community about this. I don't know how to make it work, but how to propose that. Recently, there is a group of people, the Dragon Maintainer created a mailing list and a group of discussion about debugging stuff and participating on that. And hope uh, more people can participate and we make more a community of Kingdom people, right? Instead of uh, spread. So that's it. Mostly, uh, I hope we can, uh, you can now see a bit more how the bank works under the hood and whatnot. Uh, multiple ways of collecting data with trade-offs. It's an area full of trade-offs. There is no perfect solution. You need to choose your battles. Like, I prefer more data, I prefer more reliability, right? Uh, things to improve, we have a bunch of them. And finally, I I'm really, I'm really appreciate the effort of Valve and the Linux gaming community improving stuff that it wasn't expected to improve, like a crash. You don't expect it. gamers are improving crash, which is so rare, but it's happening, right? So it's very good. That's it. Thanks for your attention, and feel free to ask questions and whatnot. Thanks. So, uh, does Valve, I mean, does Steam Deck reports the errors? I don't know. I don't know. You know, because the Sentry stuff is is work in progress for their side as well. So they might receive stuff, but I don't know how it's, it's, it's going. The deck has only one year. They, they usually call Valve time some stuff. Uh, it's like the time that Valve takes to, to do some stuff. I don't really uh, know this, why they use this terminology, but sometimes might. Now, this, this new tool that are being used to collect logs collect more stuff. It collects uh, not only crashes, but uh, GPU hangs or some user space stuff. They configure to have a bunch of collectors. So I guess now the thing is going to be more used. Uh, in the future. Yeah, I was just mm. wondering. I mean, I think that maybe you know, KDump is more popular because servers. Uh, I mean, the way I see it, at least. I mean, servers were what was what really pushed Linux development in the past mm -hmm. twenty years, right? And companies are extremely uh, picky and, and sensible ab around crashes because they usually run critical stuff mm -hmm. on servers, right? So they don't want the, the server to crash. And if it crashes, they usually want you to, to, to find out what is going on the first time, right? So if you take a look, for instance, mainframes, they have not only data, but they have a bunch of information that is collected uh, from the firmware, because ideally, at least they say that uh, they would not require a customer to reproduce an issue to debug it. Mm. It's more or less right. you know, prohibited in the mainframe world, mm -hmm. right? Um, on, on other server architectures, I mean, it, this is more common, right? Whenever a uh, customer hits a crash, you ask, oh, what was happening? Let's try to reproduce. And sometimes some customers are more flexible, right? 
Now, if you go to, you know, more embedded like devices for end customers instead of companies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, I mean, people are usually much more or much less concerned about crashes, right? I mean, what's going to be impacted in this case, it will be the game, right? But yeah. I mean, in theory, nobody's losing money or something like that, right. in theory. In theory. <laughs> so maybe that's why these tools were not developed. Uh, I mean, these more simple tools, right, were not developed because, anyway, I'm just wondering. Yeah. No, it makes sense. But the, on the other side, I guess, if every, since it's so cheap to enable PSTAR, it's so simple, yeah, yeah, yeah. we should enable that. And if people want to enable them, great, enable as well. But mm -hmm. if not, we at least have PSTAR. Yep. But, yeah, but um, Rain Foods has a kind of a last general form of PSTAR. So PSTAR was written after Rain Foods. We had Rain Foods before. Mm, right? Right. And both Chrome OS and Android use that. And so I think they have their own issues. One of the problems that I see with Red Hood, and I don't want to ask you, because um, since this score has been developed and now we have Unify and AC Young, mm -hmm. I was uh, expecting that you would tell us that you were using Bills, not Red Hood, because when you reset the system, how do you ensure that the Red is still there? <laughs> it's a good question. And also, you have Figure brand new passes all challenges because you have all the boot chain and how do you ensure that that boot chain is not going to touch that RAM? I, I can't ensure, like ensure that. Really, it's, it's a problem. Yeah, but, I mean, usually the boot chain doesn't care, right? I mean, I'm the first one to run, so. Yeah, yeah they can mess with the memory. Yeah, you're right. But uh, my limited experience with the deck and one personal computer I have, x86. Uh, the memory is untouched. And I, the reason for that is that because I guess retraining the memory, you, we can retrain. You can ask the BIOS to retrain the memory and that we lose the content. Uh, DAC has a, you can like hold some buttons and do some stuff and we retrain the memory. But by default, I guess to speed up the process, they are not doing that. And I'm kind of an advocate of PSTOR, but not the RAM one. The RAM one is what we use to to deck. It works there and we have control of the hardware. So we know that uh, it's not resetting the RAM. But for, for general case, as I'm saying, that's an ideal world. We have a computer with that enabled. Well, it would be a different uh, backend. For example, UFI. Because usually the message is not so big. I mean, and it's compressed, right? It's compressed. So I don't know, 100 cable, kbytes is enough. And maybe UFI has this yeah, storage. I, I, I see some device trees that have the brand new and bad the words. So at least part of the, two, of the blue chain is aware of that configuration. I agree. It's very common. In, in I, I forgot to mention it was in the slides, but I forgot to mention it's used in Chrome uh, Chromebooks, but it's very widespread in the ARM world because of device trees. They select a piece of RAM in the device tree, small stuff to remove. So it's very common there. It's not common, I guess, in servers and desktop. This is uh, the word that people don't know, don't know much about PSTOR. But for embedded, is, as you said, Remoops is even uh, uh, precedes the, the concept of the PSTOR. It was a single backend there, right? Well, in, in servers and desktops, they are ACPI based. Yeah, right? they are not don't have space yeah. Exactly. More questions? Um, like, as a graphics developer, I, I think like about GPU crashes. Mm. Um, we have some sort of information in KDAP and PSTOR about GPUs, or we have other tools for GPU crashes. GPU resets, uh, it's very dependent on the GPU. I will talk about AMD GPU because it's off the deck and it's open source. Yeah, NVIDIA, no, we don't know anything about NVIDIA. <laughs> so uh, for AMD GPU, we have the resets. Uh, there are two, two, two stuff here. We can have the GPU reset that does not imply a noops. Oops, it's a bad condition in the kernel. But eventually, uh, the DRM module is based on user space drivers, right? I don't know much about DRM, but the Mesa stuff. So those drivers, those user space, can break the GPU. Break, like do some stuff that's not great. So the GPU itself is going to reset, but does not affect the, the rest of the kernel. So uh, there is no panic on DRM break or something like that, some CCTL. So basically, unless the, the 
this driver breaks in a way that triggers and loops and reboots the machine or, or causes the panic, basically we won't see the message and the information is available there. Uh, what, what the driver wants to make it available, right? As per my understanding in the GPU, which is not so much, but the driver does not show many important things there because there is a variability of hardware. It's very difficult to show this information. So GPU is kind of a very difficult error to debug, unfortunately. Yes. Sure. Uh, I do talk about the uh, configuring developing these systems. I was wondering how much of knowledge you have to have about other areas of kernel. How deep and has to be your knowledge to develop the tools to be tracing the other kernel you mentioned? I mean, be store, okay, down to yeah. develop those tools. How, no, no. How about the other areas of kernel, like I don't know how much do you have to know about the GPU area and RAN and CPU drivers and other parts of kernel to be able to contribute to this, those tools for everybody? I guess not much uh, because, well, depends. If you want to investigate a problem, like uh, you're using the tools to, to debugging specifically, you, you must uh, have some knowledge or study because it's very difficult to, to have not like uh, horizontal knowledge in the kernel or areas and know everything. It's not not feasible basically it's very difficult so what we do is we, we start to investigate an area once we have a problem we have a problem there like uh, oh what like for example i'm not a drm person but i i resolved this bug i showed here how i look at the code and find the, the problem found the problem there right but to contribute to the the debugging tools like kdumps and whatnot you don't need much uh knowledge of the kernel code but you need knowledge of the kernel technologies like parameters like crash kernel parameters but it's easier you can you can read documentation and get so it's not much uh, necessary to deep dive in in the kernel code for this okay. sure and how should i deal with uh, micro kernels uh, in order to improve uh, to detect some bugs or to fix it uh, with uh, embedded device example uh, should we use is there any uh, tips to use sometimes KDAMP or even vStore? Uh, considering that we are, have a limited uh, area of memory. That's the reason I guess vStore is so used in, in the embedded world, because of the li limitations. Embedded is super, right? So dependent, of course, on the embedded. There are some new uh, stuff like Ampere machine, it's ARM. I, it's not even embedded at all, I think. It's server ARM, right? But uh, usually uh, people use uh, vStore collect the data in the, the message and whatnot, and don't use KDAMP, as far as I know. Uh, we have good embedded people here that work with Linaro and ARM. I don't know if you have some expertise on KDAMP in embedded. I'm the server guy at Linaro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's difficult because of the firmware. I have a, a board there, enforced board it's called, and it's Qualcomm. And I tried KZAC there, it fails. It fails because it doesn't support KZAC, because the firmware think it's a secured flaw or something like that. Embedded is very complicated, very ad hoc. It's my feeling, my personal feeling. It's a bit ad hoc. Uh, every vendor does whatever they Like Qualcomm has a, a firmware stack yeah, on, tools, yeah. on tools, on bootloaders, and that's so very difficult to, to deal with KZAC, which is an advantage for PSTOR, because you don't need the KZAC. You don't need to, to bootstrap a new kernel. But you have limited. Uh, tooling for that, limited logs, and you cannot collect the memory, so it's a trade-off, right? Yeah, that's unfortunately true. I mean, the embed, embedded environment is is very vendor-specific, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, ARM has an initiative called System Ready, which is basically trying to build the standards for devices, ARM, de ARM platforms in general. This is started with servers. They used to have server-ready standard in the past. And, and now this was transformed into system ready, and we ha you have system ready SR for servers, and you have system ready IR for embedded devices. You know, you have multiple uh, different tiers of uh, standards. But uh, I know I see that on the server side, it's quite easy to get traction uh, on the vendors, and and they usually want to be compliant because you know. Uh, cloud providers, they all want things that are standard because they want to easily substitute one vendor by the other. But when it comes to the embedded world, there is a, a huge resistance in, in, in being um, compliant with the standards yet. I, mean, I, I think this is going to change. And I know that RISC-V uh, has similar issues as well already. And, and they are also trying to figure out a way to you know, 
to change that because if you have fragmentation it's much more difficult to build uh, an ecosystem for instance cool i hope it changes we have more standard so we don't have more time if you have more questions you can get Please to, to the army yes right thank you very much again thank you, thank you.